thinking about something you said then, Carl, about about rhythm and about getting kind of trying to get this right now. And, and actually, I think there's there's a real opportunity with what's happened with COVID um, to to really make efforts to to get this right now, uh, in the sense that for many of us, our normal patterns of of work. Um, and rhythms of, of of life and rest will have been thrown into flux a lot over the past um, couple of years, and maybe certain times more than others. Maybe with um, lockdown, uh, when people were doing stuff online, and you know everything had to change, and you had to do new stuff, perhaps stuff that you hadn't had to do before, um, get used to being separated from people. Um, I found that really difficult. I'm a I'm a people person. I'm I'm a pastor. Um, that that's my gift, and it's what energizes me. And so, being kept apart from people, um, whether that be physically, um, one of the the hardest experiences actually during the lockdown was was doing funerals, um, where you know you couldn't touch people. You couldn't shake their hands. You couldn't give them a hug. Um, uh, you know, people that you knew and loved, you'd, you'd pastored for a long time. You know, was uh, was so hard. And and yet we have this opportunity as we come back um, to say what what things can we put in place? What structures in our own lives and in our life together can we put in place um, to help do some of this stuff better? Um, I struggle to think of an an opportunity that we've had collectively to be able to do this in in such a way, um, certainly not in the time that I've been in ministry. The closest I can think to it would have been, you know, sabbatical that I had, although that's different because you've got more of a time of rest. And for many of us, this hasn't been a time of uh, a time of rest. The early days when we were trying to figure it out were great. And people would phone me up and say it must be really tough. For, for you and I was sat in the April sunshine in my garden thinking at the time do you know what this is all right um I'm, I'm quite happy with this and then stuff kicked in and it got a lot harder um but what I'm saying is don't don't miss this opportunity um that this season has for for you to um to reevaluate, to to put some more uh, of a some more rhythm um and uh and so on into your into your life. I wanted just to talk a little bit just before we come into this um, last session about kind of how things have been difficult over the past couple of years. Um, but to talk about uh, depression and um, depression, one of the the side effects of um, a lack of rest. Uh, and one of the symptoms of depression actually is, is a lack of rest, an inability to rest or a restlessness. Um, and looking at some of the stats that uh, just this morning, kind of really familiarizing myself with some of the stats. And uh, one of them is that three quarters of pastors surveyed in the UK um, said that they had been depressed at some point in the last year. So 74 percent, I think it was of pastors who they surveyed um, from the UK said that they've been depressed at some point in the past year. And that was a survey that was done in October 2021. Um, so it's a recent, you know, recent survey. Um, another thing um, that that they talked about was um, that the cause of that, uh, and this is one psychiatric association, said that um, depression um, and other mental disorders are usually associated with significant distress in social, occupational or other important activities. If you could define what's been going on for us in the past couple of years, that would be pretty close to a definition, wouldn't it? Uh, Disorder, disruption, significant distress in social, occupational and other important activities. We've experienced um, significant distress in our occupational activity. Um, if you, like me, have, have really got a lot of satisfaction out of living out your calling with people, 
then you will have experienced a significant amount of distress over the past two years. Um, and for others, you know, social things, family, if you've lost loved ones, if you've been kept apart uh, from loved ones um, over the past couple of years. So for all of us, we have gone through this time that has been really tough. And I know that many of you, because I've seen when we've been doing, um, and the downside, of course, for, for all of you, and equally for me, is that you've got my face plastered across the, across the front of the screen. Um, but I can sort of see uh, your little um, screens at the top of my screen. And occasionally when we've talked about this over the past couple of days, I've seen people nodding. Um, because I know that for many of you, you feel that. You feel that this last couple of years has been really tough. It's been tough on you in ministry. It's been tough on you personally. Um, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that, um, to acknowledge that and to say that um, it's important for us to, to have these rhythms, particularly now coming out of this time, to give us the space we need to kind of heal some of that as well. For me, one of the biggest things, I think, has been associated trauma. So in, in lots of ways, lockdown hasn't, wasn't all that hard for us. You know, we, we spent more time together as a family, which was wonderful. We're in a really blessed position that, you know, as we were saying before, a lot of people joined this morning. You know, our house is provided by the church um, you know, that we had a relative job security. Um, there were lots of things that were, were going well. But for me, a lot of the, the trauma of other things that had happened in my life, losses I'd experienced in my life, bereavements I'd experienced in my life, um, the, the pandemic tapped into that stuff. Um, and a lot of it was because I, there wasn't the distraction that normal life kind of gives you and for you know if, if any of you have been through that as well if any of you can can say yeah actually for for me in the last couple of years maybe covid in itself wasn't that hard but actually this this period of of flux this period of, of distress triggered something else in me um talk to someone about it that that would be what I'd, I'd say to you um whether that be people in your cluster groups, uh, friends, family, the, the Baptist ministers um, counselling um, service. Uh, yeah, thanks, Carl, for putting that up. Um, the CMCS, um, really good. Um, I've used them in the past um, when I've needed to talk to someone. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough to you. Um, sometimes we need that. Sometimes we just need to talk to someone about some of the stuff that's thrown up. Um, yeah, because we struggle with that as much as anyone else. I remember in my previous church, I'd, I'd had, um, you know, some some time off just with, with stress, just a few weeks, and I'd come back and somebody in the church said, I didn't think you ministers struggled with stuff like that. Um, there, there was this assumption that somehow we existed on some sort of ethereal plane, uh, you know, above everybody else where nothing kind of touched you or where you were you were so close to Jesus that you could never get sad or or low or um, burned out or, or so on. Um, you know, we struggle with this as much as anyone. I think the quote I read is it yesterday or the day before about how pastors um burn out not because they forget that they're ministers but because they forget they're human um, so we do need to, to kind of take care of ourselves um, we have this lovely drive uh, in, in Bath we're really blessed with the scenery I'm talking to people who live in the southwest of of, uh, of England and you are probably in my opinion spoiled for uh, scenery more than anywhere else um, in the country um, but for, for us here in Bath, if you drive up from Bath on the A36, A46 up towards the M4, then you've got this fantastic view out over the hills. And you can actually see down in, across into Wales and, and so on. And when I'm driving, I'm always looking out the window to um, look at this view, to admire this view and, and try not to crash 
at the same time because it's it's quite a windy road and it's an amazing view. Um, but what there are is there are these laybys um, periodically across the the route where you can pull in and you can stop and you can admire the view and take a breath and and for. For us as well, sometimes the question we need to ask ourselves when we struggled with something perhaps is, are there these places where I can stop? Are there these laybys that I can pull into and just pause for a moment and take stock of the landscape and, and where I am? Uh, and those laybys, obviously, it's a, a metaphor, but, you know, what are those for, for you? You know, what are those places in your life where you can just pull over and stop and breathe? For some people, it's going for a walk in the countryside. For some people, it's going for a swim. I was chatting to a guy in the school playground this morning. And he said, I've just been for a, a river swim. Uh, and he's been doing it every morning for the last year. And, uh, yeah, impressive, um, slightly crazy. And... Uh, for him, that's his lay-by. That's his lay-by in the day, you know, to go and do that. For some people, it's reading a book. For some people, it's going to the gym. Whatever it is for you, identify what those places are and then use them, you know. Um, take a moment, pull over. Um, take stock of the landscape of your life. And uh, that, in terms of some of the things I was talking about now, in terms of depression or in terms of, of feeling low, gives you that opportunity to kind of see, okay, this is where I'm at. And then as you carry on your journey, um, what are the things I need to put in place then to, um, to help me to continue on in, in that way? I was reading last night, Isaiah chapter 12, verse three, which says, with joy, draw water, from the wells of salvation. And what I love about that, that verse is the plural of well, the wells of salvation. You know, there's not just one. You know, this sort of life can feel a little bit like a desert at times. It can feel a bit dry. Um, and if you've only got the one well that you're drawing from, you know, that can be a long time before you see another one like that, you know. So wells of salvation, what are those places that you draw water from, you draw sustenance from, refreshment from, that help you to, to move on to the next place? Is it people? Is it events? Um, again, what are those places uh, for you? So they're just some things to think about, um, just as I was reflecting on what we said yesterday and then thinking about coming into what I prepared to say today um, that I wanted to share. But, but what I want to share today is we, we've looked at creation and, and how creation um, is, is created with this vibrancy and this rhythm and this pattern, and we're created as part of that. We've looked at, at the gift of the law and how um, this is given as a means to, to bless us, but so that we might then be a blessing to others as well. And this morning, I just want to reflect on, on the words of, of Jesus uh, when in that famous passage in, in Matthew's Gospel, which we'll read in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to tell you a story about a guy, a young man, who was working in a, a logging company you know, sawing up logs. And um, he uh, he went to get go for a job interview. And the foreman said to him, well, I want to see how quickly you can cut down this tree. And so he uh, he steps forward and skillfully with his with his axe, he felled this great tree. And, and the foreman who was impressed said to him, you're hired. You start on Monday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday rolled by. And Thursday afternoon, the foreman approached the young man and said, you can pick up your, your check at the end of the day uh, on your way out today um, because, you know, we're, we're letting you go. And the young man said, well, I, I you know, I was hoping to work a bit longer. Um, what, what's the problem? And he said, well, 
great on Monday. But as, you know, we've been going along, your productivity's just dropped off the off the scale. You know, you're cutting fewer trees down and you started really well, but just you've not been finishing. And the young man was like, I'm, I'm a hard worker. You know, I, I arrive first, I leave last, I often work through, through my breaks. Um, and the foreman kind of saw the young man's integrity um, and he thought for a minute and then asked him, have you been sharpening your axe? And the young man said, no, sir, I've been working too hard to take time to do that. Our lives are a bit like that, aren't they? You know, we sometimes are so busy that we don't take time to sharpen the axe, you know, to make sure that, that, that we are operating at a level um, where we can serve others and serve God with all that we are, because we don't take the time to make sure that we're able uh, to do that. In, in, a, in a world today that feels like it's getting busier and busier, but people are less happy and less satisfied, um, could it be um, that we've forgotten how to stay sharp? And, uh, and actually what Ben was sharing this morning was really, was really great in terms of leading us into this time because it's important to to have those times to just reflect and be still and come to God in prayer, but but so that that might lead us out. You know, if you've got a lovely sharp axe and it's sat on the side, then, you know, you're not cutting any trees down. But equally, if you're using a blunt axe, uh, you're not going to cut any trees down. So it's that, that relationship, isn't it, of staying sharp, but then um, using those tools that God has given us. Matthew 11, are you tired, worn out, burned out by religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. It's the way the message puts it. Uh, beautiful, poetic, captures the heart of what Jesus is saying in Matthew's gospel. One of the most well-known invitations uh, of Jesus. And probably... Um, the one that springs to mind most if we think about rest, you know, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Tom Wright describes it as the most welcoming and encouraging invitation ever offered. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? I won't ask you to put your hands up either physically or on the screen, because if you put them up on the screen, then it might take 20 minutes to get them down again. Um, but maybe you can ask yourself that in your, in your heart. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? You see, I think, and I shared a bit of my story over the past couple of days. For me, um, I was quite evasive in asking that question of myself, you know, that my axe was getting blunter and, and blunter. Uh, and I was getting frustrated that I didn't appear to be cutting down as many trees as I would want to do. And, and you know, I didn't feel sharp. Um, and I tried to, to follow Jesus in my own effort, my own strength. Um, and I didn't take care of myself. And I didn't always feel as though I was prepared for that side of ministry. Now, college does a, a lot of good things when you're training. And there's a lot of things it can't do 
because you know you you live and learn and work on the job um but for me uh i don't know carl whether you felt this or whether others who have trained have felt this i didn't feel that there was this was talked about a lot no one really talked about burnout no one really talked about what happens if you feel you're not sharp anymore what happens if you're struggling um you know we were kind of in a bubble and that bubble was was great in terms of giving us the space and the freedom to learn theological um, frameworks and foundations that would, you know, help for ministry. But in terms of that stuff, what happens when when things aren't okay? Um, you know, there, there wasn't really um, that there. And so when that bubble burst for, for me, um, it burst hard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we... The stuff we talked about in, in lecture rooms, no one really talked about that in church. You know, no one wanted to debate the, you know, ontological nature of, of the Trinity or what have you in, in around the coffee table in church. But people were talking about stuff that was real to them, the struggles that they had, the pressures that they had in life. How do I follow Jesus in today's world? How do I pray? How do I take seriously um, the call that God has for me to reach out and, and um, make a difference in my, my community. Um, I remember reading a meme once, you've probably seen it, that said, if you, um, if you want people to like you, don't be a pastor, sell ice cream. Uh, now, that, there's, sometimes that's tempting <laughs> to go and sell ice cream. Um, and there's certainly truth in that to a degree, but it kind of felt for a long time as though what I was doing was some sort of theological ice cream selling, you know, or ecclesiastical ice cream selling, that I was just trying to give people what they wanted, trying to keep people happy. Um, and that, that, that was my job uh, as the minister of the church, was to kind of keep people happy and to tell them that God loved them and, and that, that was it. And so I felt kind of unprepared for that, for that reality. Um, and so that mindset led me to being worn out and, and tired. Um, now, your situations might be different. And I'm conscious when I talk about this stuff that, you know, if I'm talking about things from quite a, a negative place in terms of where I was at, some of you might not be feeling that. And if that's true, that's great. If you're not feeling tired, if you're not feeling worn out, if you're not feeling burned out by religion, God bless you. Um, fantastic. Um, you can share your secrets with us in the, in the chat. Um, but for some people, some of you may be feeling that. Um, and, and part of me sharing that honestly is just to let you know that, that that's okay. Um, it's okay to feel like that from time to time. There's a great bit in the book, the, the Peter Brain book, uh, a chapter that, that says depression, uh, de depression needn't be depressing. Um, and he talks about, um, you go two big words, so endogenous and exogenous depression. So depression that, that comes from external sources, like when we experience a, a loss or a bereavement, uh, and then internal stuff, which is to do with the way biologically and chemically we're made up in terms of mental health. The, the, the internal stuff affects maybe four or 5% of the country. Most other depression or, or low moods come from external sources. And the encouragement for that is that it means that if we can address those things, and take time to, to respond to those things, then it needn't be a place that we stay in. But it requires us to acknowledge them, it requires us to name them in order, and then create the space to be able to deal with them in order that, that that might happen. But at some point, you might be in that place, even if you're not in that place now. And at some point, you might know someone who's in that place. You might be pastoring someone in that place. You might be working alongside someone in that place. You might be married to someone who's in that place. Your kids might be in that place. And so it's important just to, to acknowledge 
and understand how how can we respond when we find ourselves in those places it's no good to, to just keep on keeping on um I, I really do believe that just that keep your head down barrel through i don't in my experience it doesn't work um and, and it certainly doesn't make things better and you're going to have to deal with it at some point um so so you might as well try and deal with it now Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. What's interesting about this phrase, come to me, um, which in the message is in the middle of, of the passage, but uh, in, the, in a lot of other translations begins with that. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary. Um, is that there are lots of times in the Gospels where Jesus kind of says, come after me. Jesus says, follow me. But this is the only time where Jesus says, come to me in the Gospels. And, and that difference, and, and it's a small difference in words, but I think the significance is, is key. It should cause us to sit up and take notice. Um, of what Jesus is saying here. The uniqueness of that call um, should cause us to take notice because this is about life. Um, this is about life, living full and free life. And the question for all of us in terms of the patterns that we have, um, ultimately, uh, in terms of saying, is this working for me? Is this pattern working for me? Is that end result? Is the way you're living and the balance you have and the rhythm that you have of work and rest, is that causing you to experience fuller and deeper life? And, you know, only we can answer those questions, maybe, as I said yesterday, with the help and the honesty of people around us, um, because this is what God wants for you. It's what God wants for us. What God wants for, for me is is full and free life. The, the title of the book, you know, Infused with Life, um, tried to kind of capture that for me. This is what God wants us to be infused with, with his life and the fullness and the, the freedom that that life comes to, to bring. But the great thing is that that invitation is offered not to people who are already getting it right, not to, you know, someone who's already got some great rhythm and pattern in their life there it comes to the people who are worn out and burned out and tired and weary and carrying heavy burdens that's who jesus invites to come to him those people who have become victims through negligence or weakness or their own deliberate fault of the fast paced and demanding world that we live in it's it's those people uh, maybe that's you and me who need to receive that invitation of jesus again and to step into um, real life and what real rest looks like how will we respond to that invitation because that it's a different level of invitation. It's one thing to, to look logically at Genesis and say, we're created to exist within a pattern. It's one thing to receive the, the Ten Commandments and to say, okay, well, here's a, a command that I'm given to, to rest and honor the Sabbath. But when we hear the Savior stand in front of us and say, come to me, all you who are worn out and burned out and carrying heavy burdens. And I'll tell you what real life's all about. I will show you what real rest is all about. How are we going to respond to that? Will we respond to it? Will we just hear it and say, that's lovely, Jesus, but I'm kind of busy. And uh, I'm just going to get back into the same patterns that I have. That's the temptation. A conference like this, it's great. 
you come away. Hopefully, stuff in these sessions has been useful to you. Um, but it'd be very easy to forget all of it or leave it in a notebook that you put on the shelf and then in five years' time find it again and go, oh, yeah, I was going to do something about that. Um, or, or will we put these things into practice, respond to them, say, no, I don't want to just get back on the hamster wheel that has been ministry uh, for the past few years or decades for some people. I want to choose to walk a different way. I want to choose to come to Jesus and let him teach me the unforced rhythms of grace. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. There was an archaeologist sorry, who once hired a tribe of South American tribes people to lead them to an archaeological site deep in the jungle. And they've been moving for some time through the jungle, heavy work, cutting down um, the undergrowth to kind of force their way through. And all of a sudden, the tribes people just stopped. And they sat down and uh, the archaeologist was getting impatient and, and then a bit angry. No matter how much he kind of cajoled the tribes people, they wouldn't go any further. And then all of a sudden, their, their mindset changed, their attitude changed. They picked up their gear and they set off once more through the jungle. And when the bewildered archaeologists finally stopped at the end and asked them what was the reason for this pause in the middle, why they'd waited so long, one of the tribes people said, we'd been moving too fast and we had to wait for our souls to catch up. Do you ever feel like that, that you've been moving so fast, you just need some space for your soul to catch up? Because you kind of left it behind somewhere, um, back maybe at the last time that you really stopped, the last lay-by that you pulled into. What is it that that we can do. Jesus uh, in the, the NLRSV version uh, says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to find, create, cherish, maintain and protect places in our lives for our souls to catch up places where we can find rest for our souls what are those places for you you know this is jesus is his instruction his teaching that he's asking the the disciples to to take on board you know watch the way i do it and if we see we touched on this yesterday. Jesus and his ministry was, was a great balance of activity and rest, wasn't it? That, that Jesus certainly was, was doing. He was out ministering, seeing people, um, bringing in the kingdom. But he also had time where he was uh, resting, where he was sleeping, where he was taking time to eat and rest on long journeys where he went away into the mountains or by the lakeside to be alone with his father, that his life was punctuated with, uh, with a balance of work and rest. Many of you will know that book, The, the Purpose Driven Life. And uh, I always think it's interesting when I look at Jesus because with Jesus, there, there is always purpose, I think, to what he does. But I don't see a lot of drivenness. I don't see that 
there's not this external thing that's driving Jesus along. Um, you get a sense in which Jesus is a person who is at peace with who he is and who God's created him to be, and um, uniquely in his sense as, as the son of God, but um, from a human perspective as well, someone who, who has that balance right of, of work and rest and activity and pausing. And we need to learn um, those rhythms of him, not becoming slaves to those destructive patterns of feeling like we have to do this stuff or expectations of others that drive us along. What, what is it that drives us in the patterns and the rhythms that we have? And it's not just when we look at Jesus mimicking what he does. Um, it's about identity change, isn't it? Because we know so many people who are, I mean, I know people who are, who are not, not followers of Jesus. They don't go to church, but they're more Christ-like than a lot of the people I sometimes see in church. Um, it's not simply about mimicking behavior, but it's about identity change uh, and allowing that change that's rooted deep within us then to flow out into everything that we do and we are because activity, if you're just mimicking activity, in terms of your pattern and your rest, or you're doing it because it kind of sounds like a good idea. That's not going to last very long in the demands of life. But if you're saying, actually, I, I need you to come and change, come and change my heart so that I can live this out better. You know, then we've got an opportunity then to see that lasting change and to live within who God's created us to be. This way of life uh, is appealing. It's appealing to me. I hope it's appealing to you. But it is offensive to the culture that we live in. It is deeply offensive to the culture that we live in. And this is where Walter Brueggemann talks about Sabbath as resistance. Um, it is a resistance to the culture of the world that we live in. And Jesus said to his disciples, didn't he? Whoever is willing to follow me must take up their cross and follow after me. Now, it's an interesting metaphor, isn't it? Because we tend to think, and I've heard people say, that what that's about is how far are you willing to go? To follow Jesus, you know, are you, are you prepared to even go to the point of death to follow Jesus? Uh, but if that was the, the, the meaning behind the metaphor, then perhaps Jesus might have used a different metaphor because these guys, um, these men and women, were much more likely to be stoned to death than they were to be crucified um, because of the, the things that uh, they said and they did in following Jesus. So why this metaphor of the cross? Now, the cross, as you know, has this, um, this meaning of rebellion, of resistance. It was the means of executing people who were enemies of the state, um, who were rebels and were viewed as dangerous in that way. So for me, at least, that my interpretation, um, rightly or wrongly, but it is, it is an interpretation of, of maybe what Jesus might have been saying, is are you prepared to live a life in following me that at times may fly in the face of the power and the prevailing cultures of our society, whatever those empire structures are? Are you prepared to live in rebellion to those powers and those cultures as you follow me? And as I look at a world where people are, are tired and burned out and broken, where I see family breakdown, I see mental health problems, I see people dropping out of ministry, this is one of the prevailing power structures of our world. Busy. Uh, look busy. Be busy. The Protestant work ethic. Uh, if I'm doing stuff, 
you know, then then I'm all right. Um, what do we so hopefully? Well, I don't know. We might say it to our kids. Uh, I try not to say it um, to to my son Leo, uh, but my grandma used to say it to me. You know, the devil makes work for idle hands. Um, we we live in this culture where it's all about do do. Your identity is in what you do. Your value is in what you do. Are we prepared to live in rebellion to that power structure in our culture. And for me, Sabbath is exactly that. Honoring the Sabbath is picking up your cross and following after Jesus. It's living in rebellion to the, to the structures and the power of our culture. Um, it might not feel like that at the time. But as we do that, and as we teach others to do that, then we liberate others. Our freedom is, is great, but unless it liberates others, um, then have we really grasped hold of that message? I, I want to be free to follow Jesus with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength. Um, I want to finish the race, but I want to liberate others to finish their race. And I want to liberate others to follow Jesus in that way as well. Um, so will you, as part of honouring this Sabbath, as part of honouring this rhythm of rest, live that as an act of rebellion in the culture that you live as you seek to honour Jesus and to follow Jesus and to come to Jesus? And, it, and that's the paradox, that this revolutionary stand against the cultures of our day that we find neither easy nor light is the only way that true rest and freedom can be found andy bring bring a final thought to us yeah just i, I was just thinking then about the difficult choices sometimes you know because this stuff's important sometimes it's not easy to put into practice. Um, it is, uh, it requires hard decisions. Um, and, you know, yesterday we were talking a bit about the elephant and, and uh, the chain and actually how we've got more freedom than, than we think that we have. And, and maybe for some people, you know, there need to be big changes. Um, maybe, um, and this was the case for me, it needed um, me to move churches um, because, you know, it just wasn't, the, the culture wasn't right um, and wouldn't allow that to happen. That's a big thing. Um, and for some people, that might be a really big decision that they need to make. But, but let me encourage you, Sometimes you have to make those big decisions um, and that you actually have the freedom to make those big decisions because what, what you can gain, um, the prize, as it were, that's on offer in getting this right for you, for your families um, and for the people that you serve is worth, I think, sometimes those big decisions. Now, it may well be that that's not the case for you. Um, but it might be that you need to take ownership over or retake ownership over your practices and your patterns. I just, just to finish, read you something Eugene Peterson said. Um, he says, uh, I let other people decide what I will do instead of resolutely deciding myself. I let people who do not understand the work of a pastor write the agenda for my day's work because I am too slipshod to write it myself. But these people don't know what a pastor is supposed to do. The pastor is a shadow figure in their minds, a marginal person vaguely connected with matters of God and goodwill. Anything remotely religious or somehow well-intentioned can be properly assigned to the pastor. Because their assignments to pastoral service are made sincerely, I lazily go along with them. Now, I don't know whether any of that resonates with you, but um, maybe some of us need to uh, take, I was going to use the phrase, take back control. And now I'm going to punch myself in the leg because I hate that phrase. But 
we, maybe we need to take ownership again of setting that rhythm and that agenda and and to say no actually i need to rather than letting other people decide what i'm doing i need to take ownership of that and and decide that for myself um yeah so that was just a thought that i came i wanted to leave with you don't be afraid to make those big decisions if what they're leading you to is a greater sense of god's life for you thank you thank you so much mm -hmm.